I'm Simon Hicks. I'm Pro Director for Research uh, at the London School of Economics. That's a fancy name for what most other people say, Vice President. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to host this great event. Um, the event is one of CEP's 30th anniversary series of events in 2020-21. The Centre will be holding activities throughout the year, taking stock of the groundbreaking policy-focused research produced since 1990, looking ahead to the economic and social challenges before us. This event is also part of the LSE's Shaping the Post-COVID World series and will be live streamed to Facebook with recordings made available after the event as podcast and video. Please use the Q&A chat uh, function to ask questions and vote on your favorite questions. Uh, when we get to the Q&A, we'll be selecting questions from the Q&A. The hashtag for the event today is um, hashtag LSE COVID-19. Um, let me, before I hand over to Steve, let me first introduce our two speakers. So Steve is going to talk for about 30 minutes and then we have uh, Anna Vignola, who's going to be a discussant. Steve Machin is Professor of Economics and Director of the Centre for Economic Performance at LSE. He's Fellow of the British Academy, has been President of the European Association of Labour Economists, is a Fellow of the Society of Labour Economists and was an independent member of the Low Pay Commission between 2007 and 2014. Anna uh, Vignol is an educationalist and economist. She became Director of the Labour Hume Trust in January 2021, Previously, she was Professor of Education and Fellow of Jesus College at the University of Cambridge, where her research focused on economic value of education and issues of equality of equity in education. Anna has previously been a trustee of the Nuffield Foundation, member of the ESRC Council, co-chair of the Cambridge Centre for Data-Driven Discovery, board member of Cambridge Enterprise, member of the advisory board of the Sutton Trust, and associate editor of Education Economics in the Cambridge Journal of Education. So we're delighted to have Anna to be an excellent discussant, but first of all, let me hand over to Steve to present. Uh, what have you What have you demonstrated for us over thirty years of your research at CEP, Steve? Okay, great. Um, uh, many many thanks for the uh, very nice uh, nice introduction. Um, let me just share my slides before before we get going. Okay, hopefully hopefully everybody can see see them. Okay. Um, so, as, as, as Simon said, this is the third of the um, three public event lectures that we've, we've, we've had this year, this academic year, uh, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the uh, Centre for Economic Performance. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, one of the primary research areas that I've been involved with um, during uh, the CEP's uh, existence, uh, which is about the mobility across generations uh, in economic status uh, that people experience. Uh, so just to provide a little bit of background before we, we, we get into the, get into the, um, into the talk. Um, this is something which um, various uh, people, I, I should acknowledge the many co-authors I've had uh, in, 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 in this work that I'll be talk, talking about today, actually Anna Vignol's been one of them um, uh, back in the day. Um, so, we, so we started working on these kind of areas in, in the mid-1990s after CP uh, uh, first, um, first set up in 1990. Um, uh, we had a paper in the Economic Journal in 1997, uh, but it really took off in the early 2000s um, when uh, we wrote a paper uh, showing that um, social mobility seemed to have um, slowed down and actually um, fallen uh, in, 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 in Britain um, over time. Uh, and, and, and actually that Britain's positioned in a very low level uh, in, in international terms. Uh, and so, um, so the, the work has sort of progressed there. So what I want to talk about is, 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 is how that work has progressed over time, uh, running right up to date to the impact of COVID um, on social mobility, which I'll talk about, um, talk about right at the end. What I would say is, is, is the work that we've done here uh, on, on, on the, uh, on the uh, intergenerational mobility uh, in economic and social status is a sort of natural direction of travel that followed the work that we've done on inequality and unemployment. Uh, before at the centre. Uh, and so we've sort of moved on, moved on, moved on from there. Okay, so let me just uh, let me just begin with showing you um, a number of uh, a number of features, uh, a number of images and uh, that will appear at various times, um, at various times um, through, through this talk, running from the Great Gatsby on the top uh, uh, upper quadrant down to COVID on the end and various other things that will fit into the story that I'm going to tell. Um, in between. Um, so let me begin by, um, by talking about, um, about some of the research that we've done on social mobility and, and highlight some of the key findings that have come out of work, um, the work agenda that's been undertaken at CEP. Uh, 
Okay, so the first thing is that social mobility is relatively low um, in, in, in Britain. Um, uh, it's, this chart here shows the frequently used measure of, of, of um, intergenerational mobility, uh, which is the essentially the correlation between, um, between people's earnings and the earnings of their parents measured at the same time in their own respective generation. And so you can see here that the elasticity is bigger uh, in Britain than in most countries on this chart, which suggests less mobility. So your earnings uh, when you're in the labor market are more tied to your parents uh, in Britain, high level in the United States as well. Um, whereas the Scandinavian countries on the left and the countries like Australia, uh, Canada, France um, uh, are sort of in the, in the middle of the international lead table. So social mobility is pretty low uh, in Britain. This is confirmed by a lot of research over time. Uh, these, these are measures of um, uh, mobility and economic status. I can't seem to move my slide on. Oh yeah, okay. Um, a, sec a second feature that comes out of comes out of uh, international comparison work is that actually higher inequality means lower social mobility. So in countries where inequality is higher, this chart measures inequality by the Gini coefficient. A bigger Gini coefficient means you've got a more unequal uh, income and earnings distribution in in a respective country. And you can see there's a very strong relationship here between uh, between the um, the level of uh, uh, social mobility. Uh, measured by earnings and the Gini coefficient. So in more unequal countries, um, there's, there's less, uh, less social mobility. Uh, this, is the, this is the curve, the hence the Great Gatsby uh, uh, comment before. Uh, this, is, this, this has been enabled by, by the late Alan Kruger um, as the Great Gatsby curve, uh, showing how inequality and um, lack of social mobility are strongly correlated. Um, it's also true that if you want to look at directions, of course, if you think about if you're thinking about social mobility, then uh, if it's changing over time, then that means some people are moving upwards and some people are moving downwards. Uh, so actually upward mobility from the bottom uh, is pretty low in Britain as well. Not quite as low as in the United States, uh, but much lower than in various of those other countries that I showed you on that, on that first, um, on those first two charts as well. So the probability of moving up from the bottom 20%, so if you grew up in the, in the, in the lowest fifth of family incomes, the probability that you move up to the highest 20% is quite a lot lower uh, at about 9% uh, in, in Britain uh, than it is in, say, Denmark or Canada. Uh, I mean, I could have put other countries on here as well. Uh, and, and so basically, you know, if, if, if everybody stood an equal chance, it would be 20%, but it isn't. It's down at around about 8 or 9%. Uh, to get to go from the bottom uh, fifth to the top fifth. So your chance of going from the bottom fifth to the top fifth. It's also true that this is, this is the paper I mentioned before, uh, uh, which, which we wrote in the, early, in, the early in the early 2000s. The first draft I could find was in, in 2002, uh, where we use very rich cohort data. We have very rich birth cohort data in Britain. Uh, so it, we have these birth cohorts who are followed over time. And so you can follow people when they're growing up into adulthood. And so we can compare people's earnings with the earnings of their parents uh, when they were growing up. So two of the well-known cohort studies was the 1958 cohort, which is a National Child Development Study, which is everybody who was born in the week of March 1958. And was a very, very similarly structured, uh, structured um, 1970 cohort, 12 years later, um, the British Birth Cohort Study, uh, which is everybody who was born in Britain in a week of April uh, 1970. And so you can basically track people at various ages. Um, so this, is tr this, tra this tracks people through to, um, through to when, when they're in their 30s and earning, and, and it shows the prob probability of moving from different quintiles, that's different fifths of the uh, parents' income distribution uh, when you go into your own generation. So this here, this number down here was the number I was talking about before, when I showed the probability of upward mobility um, from, the, uh, from the bottom to the top. Uh, and so you can see here, you kind of get this U-shape here, so that you're much less likely to get to the top if you're born in the bottom, uh, in the bottom fifth, and you're much more likely to stay in the top if you're born in the top fifth. So it's a kind of a U shape. And the interesting thing here was this: this, this link seems to strengthen across these cohorts. So actually, the, the U shape here is much more pronounced. And actually, this being stuck uh, in the top uh, if you were born in the top 20% um, is actually much higher. Uh, in the 1970 cohort compared to the 1958 cohort. So from this, we argue that relative mobility, relative social mobility got worse um, over time in Britain. 
Um, since I'm an economist, I'll just put down a very, 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 very simple model, which has been used, the so-called canonical model of intergenerational mobility. And this is useful because this can tell us what the drivers of that fall might be. So we could think about uh, people uh, earning uh, certain money in generation T, uh, say YT, as a function of their education T. And this gamma parameter here tells you how much more people earn if they've got higher education levels. The second equation uh, relates uh, people's education to their parents' earnings in generation T minus one. And so this parameter delta tells you how much, um, uh, uh, how much more people from richer backgrounds are more likely to have higher education levels. And you can put the two together by substituting this ET into here, and you get what's the usual canonical intergenerational transmission relationship, which relates the earnings of people in generation T to the earnings of their parents, T minus one. And this parameter beta was that intergenerational earnings elasticity that I showed you in the first tables. So an example here would be in the British cohort study, it's point in, for people at age 42 in 2012, beta equals 0.377. Uh, and so I'm going to come back to that a little bit later on and, 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 and talk about that. This uh, beta rose from the, the beta in the 1958 cohort, and that's why mobility fell. But the reason why mobility fell, you can think of these two drivers here, uh, the gamma and the delta. Uh, and so you can ask the question about whether beta going up is because of uh, a change in gamma or a change in delta or both. It turns out it's due to both. It's because both earnings became earnings inequality rose and because educational inequality rose. Um, so on the first of these, here's an example of labor market inequality in Britain between 1980 and 2019. Uh, I stopped in at the end of 2019 because we don't want to get contaminated by uh, the events that occurred uh, since uh, March of 2020. Um, so the 1910 wage differential shows you the ratio of um, the earnings of somebody 10% from the top of a distribution, the 90th percent percentile, as compared to somebody 10% from the bottom of the distribution. So back in 1980, uh, that person who was 10% from the top earned about 2.65, I think this is 2.65 times as much as somebody who was at the 10th percentile of a distribution. This goes up massively through the 1980s, very, very rapidly, and carries on rising uh, to around about 2010, after which it plateaus and, 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 um, uh, and stays relatively constant. Uh, in the period since 2010. But the point here is it's gone up to about something like about 3.65. So this is a very big rise um, in, in wage inequality. Uh, and so one of the features behind um, falling social mobility is the fact that the, um, the, there's been a big rise in the inequality of wages. There's also been an increase in the inequality of education. And so, as I say, both of these factors contribute to the fall in social mobility that occurred, but I showed you across those cohorts. Uh, this left-hand chart here shows you a measure, some measures of educational inequality, uh, that education equation, if you like. So people from the poorest quintile, the poorest um, 20% here, this is the fraction, this is the, poor, the percentage of people who got a degree by age 23. So 1981 is people from the National Child Development Study, the 1958 cohorts. Uh, 1993 is the British cohort study, and then these are updated from other data sources as well. So you can see that people from the poorest Poorest quintile, hardly anybody got a degree uh, by, by, by age 23 uh, back in 1981. It goes up a little bit um, over time, but we know that higher education expanded massively in Britain, especially in the early 1990s, uh, but continued to expand um, subsequently. If you look at the richest quintile, you see very, very big increases. So to over half of the people by 2017 um, had, had completed a degree by age 23. So if you take the gap between the richest and the poorest, uh, just the difference between those bars. You can see the measure by as a metric of education inequality, it rises very sharply um, over time. So educational inequality has gone up as well. If you wanted to talk about it in the metric of that model, it would say that the um, the people from richer backgrounds have improved their education position faster than people from, from poorer backgrounds. Uh, there's also other worrying things on the educational inequality side of things here. This right-hand chart is from a survey carried out by the OECD about, um, about um, a program for international adult competencies. Um, and this shows you numeracy levels, basic skill levels of, of adults um, in Britain, aged 30 or less in the gray bar and aged 30 or over in the black bar. Now this survey carried out by the OECD is carried out for, it was carried out in 2012 for, for um, 26 countries. 
the, the, in, the numbers for England, and it is England, are really very unusual in that survey in that there's only two. So level one is level one or lower is the worst, level four or higher is the best. Um, in, in, in 24 out of 26 countries in, in the survey, um, the younger people were doing better um, than, the, than the older people. So as education progressed over time, uh, their numeracy levels were improving. It's stalled completely in Britain and, and in, in, sorry, in, in England. Uh, and, and, and hasn't changed at all. So there's no improvement in basic skills. It's true for liter literacy skills as well. The other country uh, that has this feature is the United States, which is also, as you saw in the first chart, uh, one of the le very low social mobility um, countries. Um, there's other aspects of rising educational inequality. As I said before, education has been expanding massively. Um, over time, and there's actually what we term in one in one of the books, which I'll come to, that we've written about social mobility as as an educational arms race. That as people have caught up over time, uh, then people from richer backgrounds go to the next stage. So if you go back to the 1950s and 1960s uh, in Britain, a long time ago, um, when hardly anybody stayed on after the compulsory school leaving age, uh, you you saw that the people who did would be people from richer backgrounds. But as people caught up. And, and started staying on after that, then people went to the next stage and went to university. Uh, and then you can see that actually here that the undergraduate degree was being caught up on as well. And so increasingly people have shifted to postgraduate degrees and elite universities. So the returns to elite universities, elite undergraduate institutions and postgraduate degrees have been rising um, over time. Uh, the, other, the other wage payoff in the labor market, I told you wage inequality has gone up and part of that is because of increased wage returns to education. Uh, the private state school wage differential has also risen over time. So people, are, people who in more recent cohorts who went to private school actually earn more than people who went to state school on average uh, for both men and women um, over time. So you can see that educational inequality has underpinned this fall in social mobility um, as well. Okay, let me, to, let me talk to another key factor that's happened in the labor market. Um, uh, here in, 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 this, in the facts that I'm first introducing. So real wage growth uh, has become very weak um, in Britain over time. This left-hand chart here shows you, shows you wage growth normalized at zero uh, back in 1980, so indexed to zero, and it shows you growth uh, that occurs subsequently at three points in the wage distribution. The 90th percentile, the top line, which is, as I said before, the person who's 10% from the top of the wage distribution, uh, the median, which is somebody who's halfway, the person who's exactly halfway uh, from the top and the bottom, uh, the 50th percentile, and the 10th percentile at the bottom. So this has found out over time, this is what I, I was talking about inequality rising before. Um, but since you get to the, um, in, including very big fanning out occurring in the 1980s and, and, and 1990s, uh, once you get to somewhere just, probably just before, it depends which data source you look at here, but probably just before the global financial crisis, uh, you can see wage growth seems to sl slow down a lot and actually goes off a cliff uh, at all points, apart from right at the bottom where the minimum wage has kept uh, wage growth up. Um, but you can see that real wages have stagnated and fallen since the mid-2000s, and the growth has been extremely weak in international terms here. If you look at the right-hand chart, only Greece uh, does worse than the UK. Uh, in the 10 years since 2000, in the period between 2008 and 2018. This is wage growth. So Poland at the top experienced 30% wage growth. Britain had minus 2%. Um, the UK had minus 2% over this time period. So we do very, we've done very badly. Now you might say, what's that got to do with social mobility? Um, well, one, and everything I've shown you so far about social mobility has been about relative social mobility, about where you are relative to other people. Um, of course, if wages aren't growing, uh, then you're, 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 you're in, in, in absolute terms, then that may have implications for social, for social mobility. So here, people's real wages were actually, were actually falling. Back here, uh, people's real, wage, real wages were, were actually growing. And so you can actually ask the question here about these people whose who's, who's real wages have been falling, how, how well or badly they're doing against their pa what their parents were earning at the, at the same age. And so it turns out that absolute intergenerational mobility is falling as well as absolute as relative mobility because, because real wage growth has stagnated and fallen. So this actually means this is actually the percentage of people who are from 1995 to 2019 who are earning more, sorry, earning, earning sorry, earning, earning, the chart is people who are earning more than their parents were. So 60% did in 1995, that's dropped to about 45% because of this fall in real wages that's occurred. So actually we've got a picture where both relative mobility and absolute mobility are falling. Uh, 
Uh, now, 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 the debate in, in, about intergenerational mobility is not just about, about intergenerational mobility and economic status. There's many other metrics that have been used in very sizable literature uh, in, in social sciences. And in fact, uh, economists sort of came fairly late to the game in, in some ways. There's been a very long, very long established literature in social science uh, looking at social class mobility. Uh, and there's many other outcomes you can look at as well. So I think it's worth spending a couple of minutes just focusing in the discussion and the light of the discussion so far about the levels and changes in earnings mobility, about what other uh, measures might tell us about it. Uh, so I'm going to show you four. I'm going to show you social class, I'm going to show you home ownership, I'm going to show you wealth, which is notoriously hard to measure, and I'm going to show you some geographical dimensions as well. There's many others that feature in, in empirical research, and actually the methods of looking, the statistical methods actually date back to Francis Galton in 1886, who looked at um, high intergenerational height correlations and uh, wrote the first paper about, famous paper about regression to the mean, about the fact that height shows, height is strongly persistent across generations, but does regress back to the mean. Um, so let me just run through these. Uh, so the social class one is, is an important one to show because it depends how you measure social class about what happens. So there was, uh, in, this, in, in the work we've been involved with at CP, there was, what, was actually quite a controversial uh, aspect of it, where there was debates about whether mobility really had fallen or not over time. And, and so was, uh, many, a number of eminent sociologists actually wrote about this and said, actually, if you look at social class, uh, this doesn't um, show much changes over time, despite being very low in international comparisons. Uh, so John Goldthorpe um, and, and, ver and, ver and various um, colleagues has written quite a lot about this. Um, it's actually interesting, though, when you start looking at some broad social class measures, of which was um, uh, very broad social class measures like people being managers or professionals uh, or skilled manual workers and so on, uh, actually do show little change over time. But you can actually reconcile this because actually if you look at more finely graded occupational measures, they become much more persistent. And there's various uh, colleagues in in, in, in sociology and in the International Inequalities Institute who've done very, very important work uh, on this, who are, who are cited there at, at, at LSE. Um, it's also true that actually, if you look within those broad social class measures, the earnings inequality, the metric that we were looking at before actually rises. So it rises within the groups of managers, within the professional groups. And so that actually does reconcile across the discrepancy and cross time differences between social class and earnings. So you might say, well, what's the right, what, is, is, is mobility for and what's, what's the right thing you might want to look at? So I can show you other metrics which display very strong uh, increases in persistence and falls in social, and imply falls in social mobility over time. So one of which is whether you, when, 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 whether you yourself uh, own, own your own home, whether you're an owner occupier, if your parent was when you were growing up or if your parent wasn't when you were growing up. And so this is a comparison between 2000 and 2015 of this, of this kind of example. So in the 1958 cohort, you can see here that um, a large number of people, this is almost at the peak of home ownership uh, in, 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 in the time series in, in Britain, uh, measured in 2000, uh, uh, when, uh, when, when 88% of people owned their home if their parent did uh, when they were growing up, and 74%. So it was quite a big gap here, 14.2 percentage points, but this widens out massively as it seems that people just can't get on the housing ladder to, to, to buy their own home if, 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 if their parents were not a homeowner uh, when they were growing. So this falls massively rather than a much more modest fall in, in, the, top, in the top line. So hence the um, bank of mum and dad um, uh, image that was placed upon the, uh, on, on, on the first set of slides. Uh, wealth is very difficult to measure, but actually if you combine the cohort data and information from the very rich wealth and assets survey, this seems to suggest that intergenerational wealth transmission has increased as well. So there's been a fall in, in, in wealth mobility uh, uh, over this time period between 20, 2000 and 2016. And the final one, geography, where you grow up matters. And it matters, seems to matter more now than in the past uh, in, in, if you come from a low social mobility place. Here's a couple of examples just to illustrate that. Uh, one, one on the labor market, one on, uh, on, on, on politics. Uh, so the left-hand chart here shows you a very strong relationship. This is the um, Social Mobility Commission, Social Mobility Index, running from low at minus 100 to high at plus 120 uh, on, on, on the x-axis on both of these. So here you can see that wages are much higher uh, in place, real wages are much higher in 2015 in places where uh, social mobility was uh, was higher. And here you can see a very, very strong relationship, a percentage voting leave 
uh, in the 2016 uh, EU referendum uh, is, was much higher uh, in places where social mobility was low or social mobility is low. Uh, and so you can see that this it matters not just for economic outcomes um, as well. Okay, so um, that's the kind of facts I wanted to talk about. Let me talk, let me talk about, um, uh, we have a book entitled The Enemies uh, of, of Social Mobility, social mobility, social mobility and Its Enemies. So here's a few examples. I don't have time to talk about these, but there's many examples we can think about here uh, about uh, which, which are things that drive inequ inequ excessive inequality being one of them, so some aspects of government policy, uh, bad employers, elite education, uh, simple explanations. It's not, maybe not quite as simple as, as many people want to think, hence the reason I've run through many of those kinds of uh, different measures before. Uh, people trying to cheat admissions procedures, opportunity hoarders, and so on. So there's a large number of these. Uh, but more fundamentally, I think maybe we might want to say that all of us might be to some extent. Uh, and so these were two books that I've written with my colleague Lee Elliott Major. The first one I've just referred to what we we're talking about in social mobility. Centers. The second one is what do we know about social mobility and what should we do about it? So what I want to talk about next is what th th that aspect of it about what we should do or what should we do about it if we think so social mobility is too low. Okay, so change could, you know, it, 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 we don't have to be stuck with this. Uh, change, change could or can or could generate more mobility. And I can give you several examples about why that, why that might be the case. You know, the first is the obvious thing, but other settings do have more mobility than the position um, in the UK. Uh, clearly countries that have more egalitarian economic systems uh, do. Uh, if you want to draw a particular Anglophone comparison, you might think language comes into it. So let's think about Canada, Australia. I'm just going to show you that chart I showed you right at the start again here. You can see that Britain's up here, whereas Canada and Australia are down here. Uh, and you could see that you would need quite a percentage increase to get down there. So maybe we can learn some lessons from what goes on in most kind of places. The Scandinavian countries, even more so, uh, they have much lower levels of inequality and therefore much lower levels of, uh, and much, much higher levels of social mobility. That's one aspect. Um, it also wasn't always true in the past. Uh, in, 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 in that second book I mentioned, um, we write about the four ages since uh, World War II, uh, of which I've spoken mostly about the recent ones um, in this talk so far. But you can, you can actually put these four ages into these quadrants on this chart, where we run from less equal society to more equal society uh, on, on, on this line, and we run from le less economic growth to more economic growth on this. Um, so actually, back in the 1950s and 1960s, in the golden age, uh, social mobility didn't fall at all. Absolute mobility rose to everybody because real wage growth was quite fast. Uh, and uh, social, relative social mobility didn't fall at all. If anything, it probably improved from the limited evidence base we have. Uh, if you want to move to where we, the most recent period here we have, where we have declining uh, relative mobility and absolute mobility, uh, then we're down here. OK, so what could we do? Um, so... We talk about this quite a lot in our book, and I haven't got time to go through any of this at all, really. But one thing I would say is that educate, it, it, social mobility isn't, like many people just think about, only about education. It's about much broader things as well. I, I've clearly shown you big links to inequality in the labour market um, as well. So I think if one of, us, one of the things about the study of intergenerational persistence has taught us, uh, it's actually that the failure to make change is actually storing up greater problems for the future. Okay, now what I've written down here is, um, is fairly stylized and, 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 and fairly simplistic, um, but I think there's many ways we could make a start uh, in, 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 in trying to improve, improve social mobility if people are willing. Um, then, um, you know, there's an, it, there, well, there's simplistically here, there's the ABCD principles, which you may say, oh, well, you've just written down this list. Uh, the second half, we, we devote a whole half of the book to writing about, writing about these issues, which are about access, uh, which would be about reforming education admissions and entry to work, behavior, uh, shifting away from uh, what's become a very individualized culture uh, to winner takes all type culture, perhaps moving back to more collective notions. Uh, community, uh, not, little, not just left behind, uh, about restoring local prospects and pride and decent work, good jobs with a career progression, and key skills, vocational education. So let me just uh, give you a long list just to show that I'm not actually just writing down little buzzwords here. Uh, so many of the things we write about, about in the book are we talk about lotteries for schools and universities, uh, admissions when uh, they're oversubscribed. We talk about thinking about the uh, tax status, the charitable status of private schools. 
we talk about diversity and entry to elite professions under A. Under B, we talk about things like the law of Yante, uh, which applies in the Scandinavian countries. And that's about, not, about putting society in front of individualism. Uh, we talk about wealth taxes, we talk about social responsibility, uh, including, uh, in, including issues to do with zero carbon, including um, issues to do with worker rights uh, in, in, in the workplace. Under community, we talk about place-based policies and not being left behind, like, for example, the coastal towns have been uh, in Britain. We talk about opportunity areas, which have been successful in some countries. Under decent work, we talk about minimum wages, we talk about vocal educa vocational education and pathways, we talk about career progression, we talk about a very important issue about diversity in the workplace and about tackling workplace discrimination, and the idea that actually having properly diverse work workforces can actually raise productivity. We talk about lifelong learning, we talk about things like human capital tax credits, where government policy has been very skewed towards uh, offering tax credits to physical capital and not to have human capital like it does in, in other countries. Now, many of these, many of these very clear uh, policy issues I talk about there function very well in other countries and they function very well in other countries that have low social mobility. They don't function very well in Britain. We don't have many of them uh, right now. They don't function very well in countries like the United States, which also doesn't have uh, many of those things. OK, before I conclude, let me just move on to uh, the fact that I'm going to argue now that I think these issues have become even more pressing now, given what's happened in the past 15 months. Uh, I think it's become fairly well established, but I'll show you some numbers on this as well, that the crisis has acted, has acted to exacerbate already existent um, labour markets and education inequalities. And I've already said to you earlier on in the, in the talk that these are the twin drivers of low social mobility. Um, so it seems that um, seems that if, if, unless, the, unless these, um, these increases in the labour market and educational inequality can be offset in some way, this is, then the COVID-19 crisis is going to be worse for longer term inequality and hence will reduce um, the future so social mobility for the affected ge generations of young people who are experiencing uh, these inequalities right now. Okay, let me talk about these inequalities. The first one is inequality of labour market loss. This chart here on the left uh, takes labour force survey data of everybody aged 18 to 64 who's not in full-time education and shows what's happened to their labour market outcomes uh, since lockdown. Uh, the first lockdown took place in, on March 23rd of 2020. Um, so it's quite interesting this. So the usual metrics of recessions, typically rising unemployment, uh, don't seem to really have occurred here. So the red, the red uh, bar here is the proportion of people who are unemployed. What's actually happened, uh, and, and this of course is due to the government's furlough scheme, is but actually there's a lot of people who are still employed, this green bar, but who are not working at all. So this shows you the, 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 the green bar here is the people in the labour force survey who say they're employed, uh, but actually worked zero hours um, last week. So this took a huge hit under, under the initial lockdown and it's improved a bit Again, it's gone down. I mean, if you, the numbers in January actually get worsened again under the third lockdown that took place. What's important though is the nature of this, these labour market losses are not equally distributed um, across groups in, 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 in the economy. Uh, so they're actually bigger. The uh, labour market losses are bigger for young people, uh, for the self-employed who've taken a massive hit uh, um, in, in terms of um, their uh, incomes. Um, under COVID, uh, women, uh, already low wage workers and people from poorer families. So this doesn't augur very well for, for, for social mobility in the future. Nor does the inequality of learning losses. This left hand chart here shows you for England, uh, daily attendance rates at school. So we know, we know sort of what happened here. We know that lockdown occurred on the 23rd of March. And hardly anybody, only the, only the children of um, only the vulnerable children and children of key workers um, went went to school. And there's not that many of them there. It goes up. A, it went up a little bit when some year groups went back uh, in the summer of last year. And we reopened again uh, in, in the autumn and then closed again here. And so you can actually calculate the extent of learning loss uh, when children weren't going to school and when they're learning if they did it. Uh, moved to online learning and was delivered by parents uh, in, in the home, so moved, moved into a home environment. So I, I can't go into the detail too much, but we calculate on an average uh, there was 58% learning loss under lockdown one, 
Uh, when the children went back to school, it, that, that improves quite a lot, but doesn't go to zero. Uh, so it's about 15%. And then under the second lockdown, uh, it's better because presumably people have got more used to it, but it's 20, still 26%. So these are very, very sizable lo losses in learning time that people have had, uh, which may well have negative consequences for them in the future. The worrying thing is they're more pronounced for children from poorer families. The inequality gap between, again, the top fifth and the bottom fifth is this. So 13 percentage points higher for people in the bottom fifth gets better when they went back to school, 4%, and then goes back up again to 13%. So both inequality, there's been an increase in inequality of, um, of labor market losses and uh, learning losses under a crisis. Uh, let me say one more thing and then I'm gonna conclude. Uh, so I'm gonna go back to my model uh, that I showed before. Uh, it's still very simple. Um, so this has strong implications for, for social mobility. And so what you can think about doing is taking that very simple canonical model I, I showed before, where you have an income equation, education equation, and then you get the income transmission. Uh, and we can factor in uh, these losses from, from the crisis. So they're done in red here. So I've added here to the earnings equation a measure, a measure U, which is a measure of um, what happens to people's uh, job loss uh, situation. And so we could argue that, that would enter into the equation and it would, uh, it would have a negative effect on income. We can also, for the children's education, we think children's completed education when they leave school or leave university or when they leave the education system, uh, E, is probably gonna be damaged by these learning losses uh, and it'll be damaged by parental unemployment as well. I've also shown you that they, these are negatively related to the learning losses are negatively related to income. And so you can think about income gradients as well. So all I can do here is just do exactly the same thing as I did before and substitute these equations into the, into the, um, into the, in, 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 into the uh, income equation. And you get this sort of horrible expression, but I wouldn't worry about the horrible expression. Uh, it, you can clearly see you get this extra red term. And then this is the gap between the crisis and the normal intergenerational elasticity. So we've calibrated this on the basis of uh, what's, uh, what people have studied in the way of education scars, a job loss scars, uh, and, and so on for both the parents and for the individuals. Now, I wouldn't get too hung up on the actual numbers we've got here, but I told you that the normal time intergenerational elasticity was 0.377. So we calculate that it would go up to 0.42 if these uh, education scarring and job scarring effects are not going to be uh, offset uh, because, of the, because of the crisis. So that's an 11% uh, increase in the intergenerational elasticity. So a fall, a further quite sizable fall in social mobility because of the crisis. Now, if any of these things kick, Social mobility will be worse than it was uh, under under normal times. So we can you can debate about the magnitudes, but this you know but this seems to be a fairly sensible kind of calculation. I think I think that's done. Uh, it seems to be so. Therefore, if, if government policy on the labour market losses, the education losses, and public support is not there for those to try and ameliorate those, then it does seem that social mobility is likely to have got worse because of the COVID um, crisis as well. Okay, so on that note, let me finish. Uh, and let me finish on a slightly more, slightly more optimistic note as well. So facts about, so one thing I hope this lecture uh, has been useful in, in this, the facts about social mobility need to be much more widely known. They need to be much better known, and they need to be known much more widely known than they perhaps currently are. Perhaps then there may be an appetite to actually try and sort out the multitude of problems that have actually been stored up for a long time and have been continually stored up for, few, for, few, for the social mobility prospects of future generations. And what I would say is the incumbent economic and social model is not working to do this. It hasn't been working for a long time to do this. Hence the reasons why inequality has gone up so massively um, in, the last, in the last 40 years. Uh, hence the reasons why we've got very dislocated um, situations in certain parts of the country um, and so on. So it seems to me that the economic shocks that persist from the global financial crisis recession, the regression recession that was induced by the global financial crisis, and from the austerity cuts that, that took place in the, uh, in, in, in the 2010s, plus the magnification from uh, choosing to leave the European Union under the Brexit referendum and COVID, which I've just spoken about, seem to make it all the more pressing that society acts so that future generations have a better chance to move on up, hence the name title of the talk, uh, than, than they do right now. You know, this is sort of happening in something. So, you know, I mean, we, we, see, we see discussions about, I've seen discussions about wealth taxes, 
in, 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 the, in the newspapers today. We've seen Gareth, Gareth Southgate, the, the, the England um, football manager, saying the, well, here, the awareness around inequality and discussions on race have gone to a different level in the last 12 months or so. Hopefully we can carry on uh, with recognition of these things and actually try and improve the social mobility um, and the future generations. Okay, let me, um, let me conclude uh, at that point. Steve, that was absolutely me. fabulous. We're a tour de force from Great Gatsby to equ modelling equations. Um, please, in the audience, there's some questions coming in, some interesting ones in the Q&A. Please put your questions in the Q&A or vote on the questions that are there. But let me hand over without further delay to Anna. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Steve, for a, a great, if rather depressing, talk. Um, thank you, too, for inviting me to be a discussant. We were reminiscing before this started that I actually joined CEP in 1997, so it's a great honour to be talking at one of its uh, 30th anniversary events. It's a fantastic institution. So I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Uh, hopefully this will come through and you'll see it. Okay, so um, the first thing I wanted to say was, I think Steve has illustrated incredibly clearly how our endeavors around social mobility are or should be part of a much broader picture that uh, we should be worrying about. I think for too long, what we've tended to focus on in the social mobility literature is getting a few individuals into our elite universities, into prestigious professions. Now, don't get me wrong, it is important that elite universities and indeed prestigious professions are more diverse. That's an important part of the story. Um, but I think by focusing on what would always be uh, the tip of the iceberg, if you'll excuse the analogy, uh, we're missing the really important point, which is social mobility needs to be part of a much broader endeavor, as summed up by this quote from uh, Lee Elliott Majors and Steve Mention's book. And what matters, of course, is the prospects for the average person to move away from their socioeconomic origins. And that's where it gets tricky, because as Steve has shown us, um, moving away from your socioeconomic origins is far easier when uh, the economy is growing, when real wages are rising. And I think what we're feeling at the moment is the acute difficulty of uh, the pie getting smaller and everybody hanging on desperately to their share of it. And so I think that the political challenge of social mobility is really acute. It's never been more difficult, I would argue, to achieve greater social mobility, precisely because we've had this period of growing earnings inequality and declining real wages. So um, we now move into the COVID world. Um, and I think the really important takeaway point from Steve's talk is that pre and post COVID, we have social immobility fairly hard baked into our system. So COVID hasn't dramatically changed anything, uh, but obviously it's had a negative impact on, on individuals. But in terms of the relationships between rich and poor, um, we're likely to see more of the same. Um, I think Steve's talk also raises some really uncomfortable questions for those of us who are you know, passionate believers in education. Education, as he said, has been identified as a potential driver of social mobility. But actually, uh, we, despite decades of expanding our education system, have not severed the link between your family background and your education achievement. It's there, it's there from preschool, right the way through the school system, right up to PhD and into those professions. Um, and one could argue, um, I mean, obviously Steve makes the point that education inequality is worsened, but I think there's a stronger point there, which is education is almost, if you like, a legitimate reason to select people for some very high paid prestigious roles. And so, Education isn't just uh, sort of unfortunately more unequal. It could, you might argue, be used by many to actually maintain social positions and economic positions. And that's a real challenge for those of us working in the sector. And as I say, then comes COVID and we see that all the problems that we knew existed pre-COVID are exacerbated. And I won't go into them. Steve's already articulated them really clearly. Um, just the general loss of learning, loss of health, loss of economic security hitting uh, as always, lower income families far harder. Um, and I, I think the real point that perhaps Steve um, touched on at the end there is that if we're going to do something about this, as opposed to passively accept that, you know, COVID has hit, we will get more unequal, we will have more social immobility, we need to act, we need to invest. And I think we're having trouble 
convincing people to invest. I think there's a difference between some of the costs and spending that we have to do to deal with COVID, essential though that is. Um, that's different from choosing to invest in our young, choosing to invest in our school system, choosing to invest in those young people who are trying to make the desperately difficult transition into the labour market, just as we get the effects of COVID. In terms of solutions though, um, perhaps we shouldn't get too hung up on the impact of COVID because actually the social mobility project, as Steve has articulated so clearly, predates COVID. And some of the features, particularly of our labour market, are precisely why we have low social mobility. So we have a highly deregulated labour market. Obviously, everybody knows that. That's great. We have low levels of unemployment. But in the process, we've also got some uh, rising earnings inequality, as we've seen. We've got some problems around regulation of job quality, uh, of job safety. Some of that's become obvious during COVID. So there's an awful lot we need to do around institutions and investing in the kinds of jobs that give people uh, decent quality jobs and decent wages. Without those jobs, it's going to be very hard. We can redistribute, obviously, uh, but we're not going to succeed in making that shift. So we need to invest in the human capital of the young. And we need to, as Steve has said, think about place because the investment needs to reflect the fact that our social immobility and inequality is not evenly distributed around the country. And on that latter point, I think we do have a fundamental uh, structural problem in the UK or particularly England, which is we have a very centralized government, which doesn't sit well, I think, in a strategy that takes place-based investment at its heart. Um, but I think also we, we need to address some of the tricky bits and we can't dodge the fact that there are some really difficult questions. So intergenerational uh, mobility is what we've been talking about, but obviously intra-generation mobility or intra-generation inequality just cascades down to the next generation. So we need to think about policies that tackle intra and inter simultaneously if we're going to make the future look a lot better. Redistribution is vital, and Steve's book gives a whole list of things that we might do, but it, the redistribution, if it gets cycled back into a state that then employs or funds more advantaged people to a greater extent, as it could potentially do, is, is not enough. We need to think about the investment strategies that disproportionately invest in those that are coming from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And as I said, in terms of education, we have some really tricky questions to ask. Is education a signal? Uh, is it used by the rich to sort of uh, identify themselves as different or is it a human capital investment? Have we really got too many graduates? Have we really got too many postgraduates or do we just have graduates with the wrong skills and the wrong kinds of people getting access to higher education? And in Steve's slide, he talked about academic snobbery, elite education. Um, these are important concepts, but being very clear how they practically differ from some of the uh, excellence criteria that elite institutions, for example, use on admissions is a very difficult question to address. Um, and it's not clear to me how admissions form reform can necessarily fix it, although random allocation of people that meet a minimum standard is obviously one way to go. But we do need to think about our competitor countries, for example, investing in this high skill model. How do we go about reforming admissions in a way that, first of all, doesn't leave us at a disadvantage in terms of our skills, and our prospects for high economic growth in the future, but also doesn't leave students at a disadvantage in the sense that they've got admission to the institution or whatever, but actually then, as we're starting to see now, have very um, differential outcomes from that. So we need to think about that in a much more holistic way than we've done. And I'll just stop there, thanks. Anna, thank you very much. Um, I've just been told we can go over by five minutes. So I think we've got about just over, we've got about almost 15 minutes for questions. Um, I have questions, but I'll save them if we've got time at the end. Uh, the first question from the chat comes from Karen Mumford. Uh, she says, is the picture showing a fall in the number of people earning less than their parents for the same age? Is it the same for both genders? Do women not do better than their mothers were? I was just generally interested in the gender dimension, just not just women compared to their parents, but also women compared to their mothers. And I wonder whether there was any data on that, Steve. Yeah, it's it's it, it, it's a good question. So of course, of course, because you, if if you're going back in time, you need to factor in the fact that the the um, levels of female participation, female labour force participation, were much lower. So as 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 Karen knows, she's Karen's a labour economist, so she knows. Um, she knows she knows it depends on whether you put the zero. If you if you do it relative to the zeros, 
i.e. the people who aren't earning or not as well. Um, if, you do, if, you, if you do it without, without the zeros um, and you do it conditional on earning, it, it still falls for women, but nowhere near as much as it falls for men, which is, I guess, is what you'd probably be suspecting. Of course, if you if you do it with a zeros, you get a different pattern. So it's, it's it's a bit tricky. I mean, you can do you can do women relative to bare fathers as well, uh, and and that 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 shows a fall, uh, but not as much as the uh, men's uh, does. I mean, and we know the gender gap is narrowed, uh, and, and it's stalled actually. The gender the gender wage gap stalled, but but women wage, women's wage growth was uh, improving relative to men's over, over time. So it's not as marked before an absolute mobility for women. As, as it is for men, I think it's the, it's the answer. Uh, it's, it, it, it's, I haven't seen any, any really, really persuasive uh, research actually backing it out properly. It's, it, it's quite a complicated thing to do because of the changing composition of, of the workforce, but it's a very good question. Thanks. Um, next question comes from Mariam Umfka. I probably haven't pronounced that properly. Uh, you talked about the correlation between low social mobility and voting leave. Are there actually insights on how globalization and global economic integration impact national social mobility? So for example, our, I guess, states that are more open with more liberal trade policies have we seen i know there's research in political science that looks at the relationship with overall inequality but is there stuff that looks at the relationship with with mobility uh, uh there's not much i don't think i, I mean I and mean, you're definitely right i mean i mean there's a big literature of course on globalization and and and, and inequality and winners and, and winners and losers from uh from from from, from globalization i mean i suppose some of the stuff that does speak to it it, the, the chart's quite interesting because, of course, if you do look what the low, the, the chart I showed where the, the downward sloping relationship between um, vote leave and the, um, the social mobility of the areas. So, of course, quite a lot of those low social mobility areas are, are the ones that have been hit harder by by um, by globalization um, as well. Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, there's quite a lot of work on that, which shows that certain you know we'd be able to do enhance and stuff in America. Um, looking at the impact on, on of the China shock on 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 on, on uh, manufacturing, particularly on manufacturing employment um, in com in commuting zones. There's other parallel results for Britain uh, that show that certain areas get hit harder. So, so if you if you're willing to make that step, and then make the step to the social mobility index uh, measured in those areas, then I think you could say that there probably is some kind of relationship. But I haven't really seen anybody do that very well. I know this is an active active research field. Uh, amongst international trade economists, and so I think they're interested in broadening out, broadening out the dimensions of uh, of, of, of inequality that they study, uh, and 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 including in that the intergenerational dimension as well. Uh, right. Uh, the next yeah. question, I guess, follows on from that, which is uh, from Christopher Knott. Uh, is CP learning loss analysis re representative over a regional level? I.e., could you accurately see disproportionate learning loss by local authorities? Or is the sample size just not large enough? Okay, so we've done we've done some stuff, we've we've done some stuff for the four nations, which is actually a very interesting thing to do, uh, because they have obviously have devolved education systems, and so they actually have. Uh, so it's actually true that the um, school attendance numbers, the instruction time lost varies across the across the four nations. I mean, for example, in the autumn term, the Children in Scotland went back to school in August, whereas they only went to in the start of September in England and Wales um, as well. So there is variations um, across across the four nations. We don't have sa enough sample size really to go def definitely not down to local authority level. Um, the, the chart I showed about schools schools uh, a percentage of attending children attending schools on a daily basis are available for England for sure at local authority level on the DfE website. And so, so you can get numbers on that. Um, and, and, and it was definitely quite significant variations across, uh, across local authority. When, when the schools reopened in autumn, uh, there was quite big variations um, in that. So to start with, it seemed like it was the more disadvantaged local authorities that had lower attendance levels. But then when people had to stay and go home and start self-isolating, actually after half term, uh, that happened a lot in London and the Southeast. And so then that disadvantage kind of panned out. Um, we were, we're, work, we're working on it a bit, but um, I haven't got any results to... Really there's off, there's obviously a public-private element here too, in terms of oh, yeah. private schools stayed open longer and, and smaller classes. Oh, if, if, you, if you want to do it on the school attendance, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the independent schools, the attendance was much higher. 
in, in private schools. Uh, it's, it was also much higher in, in primary schools and in secondary schools as well. I mean, it still is now. I mean, and we, I mean it's still round about, we haven't, so the normal number, you know, there's always, there's always some, in terms of school attendance, the normal number is, I guess, one or two percent of children are off school. You know, some kids are ill. Uh, there may be other reasons why you might might not be going to school. Uh, it's never got back to it's never got back to that, that level. I, I think the most recent number from last Thursday, that's in my chart, is eighty eight percent of primary and secondary school children um, attending in England, which is well down from ninety eight percent. So, yeah. so there's still quite a chunk of people not. Not going to school. I mean, Anna might want to apply. I was say, Anna knows quite a lot of this. Asking on education, which I think I was going to ask both of you, and it kind of fits. Mm. And Anna, I'm going to bring you in next, and you can answer that one as well as this one. William Hopwood, University of Nottingham student from Stoke, says, "Will the announced increase in funding for schools be sufficient to reduce educational loss, or is more change needed for educational infrastructure, such as reducing the effects of the educational arms race?" So, Anna, as the educationalist here, perhaps you're probably best placed to to talk about this stuff. No, it's not. Um, and I think uh, Kevin Collins, the education czar, has made that clear. Um, it's insufficient in comparison with the ask that he put forward of 10 billion. Obviously, this is a much smaller settlement. Um, but it's also insufficient if we compare the amounts being spent by other countries. Yeah. Um, you can debate what the money might be spent on. And there are certainly good grounds for a disagreement about whether it should be spent on you know, extending the school day or other aspects of education. But the fact that we do need to invest to mitigate the education loss of these uh, cohorts going through the school is not, is not debatable point. Um, and the question is how much will the government invest eventually? Um, just on the point of tracking it, um, the Education Policy Institute has some research uh, using a Renaissance Learning Star Assessment. I don't know if you can get to local authority level. Uh, many schools will be uh, doing uh, some of the tests even though key stage two tests weren't held. And we should, I guess, by next year, be in a position to look at the local authority loss. But obviously, as Steve said, the biggest indicator is the absence rate. And my understanding is it's around about 30% of pupils off school, for example, in the Bolton area, as of now. Um, all of that is documented and we can then look to see, sadly, the impact of that on children. Great, so couple, Michael Joffe has asked, does the government's leveling up rhetoric promise to have any useful effect on these issues? Steve, you want to have a go uh, on that one? I mean, I, mean, I mean, yes and no. I mean, a lot of it is rhetoric, which is a bit, um, you know, the way and much of it's much of it's phrased. But I mean, I mean, I mean, clearly, place there is a really important place-based dimensions to this, and there's a whole host of aspects of that. Uh, so, so of course, uh, of course. My colleague Henry Overman is, is the real expert on this, but I can sort of paraphrase some of the things he tells me. I think um, so. You know, it's, I mean, and it actually, it does do, it does dovetail with the with the higher education expansion, of course, because many people uh, leave, leave. Many of the people who do well at school leave places, and then the left behind uh, don't seem to do anywhere near as well. Employers don't want to go and locate there because there's not skills based there as well. And that this has been a perpetual problem for a long, long time. So part of it, part of the higher expansion of higher education kicks in on this and the lack of offering good vocational education is really important. Uh, and, I, and by the lack of offering really good vocational education, I mean the stuff that meets the needs of employers and employers know what, they, what, 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 what they're getting as well, because it's been you know, woeful uh, vocational education for a long time. Um, I was going to ask the next, what next question Michael uh, asked, which I'm going to put to you, Anna. Going to that as well. um, would greater attention to practical manual skills in schools rather than traditional academic focus help? And I guess that relates also to the debate about further education. Um, you know, and I always, you know, lots of people love further education, but I recall somebody saying further education is what we want the next door kids to do. Uh, yes, um, that is a, a refrain I've heard before. So that, I think there are two aspects to it. I mean, first of all, um, you know, half the cohort doesn't go to university, whichever way you cut it. Uh, the half that doesn't go to university ends up in FE colleges. FE colleges by any measure are disproportionately underfunded relative to other bits of the education system, even relative to schools. Um, and universities have to see have had higher levels of funding. So um, our system is set up to invest less in that um, half that doesn't go on to higher education. And we have to address that. Um, I'm quite positive about the rhetoric around that place-based investment in the sense that hopefully it's not rhetoric but uh, the place-based approach I think has real strengths and, and in policy terms I can see people thinking about it in a way that they haven't done in the past 
Um, but where I'm more concerned is the difference between uh, a place-based approach where you take what you're doing and try to distribute it around the country versus serious efforts to join up places with investment strategies that are appropriate for the skill needs of that labor market, that are appropriate for the employers in that area that link up FE and HE, because it's not enough to invest in that FE. You need those links through so that people can progress if that's what they want to do. So I think these are real major issues. Our vocational system has always been the weak part of our education system. Absolutely. Um, uh, Ria, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Ria Evandich asks, what do we know about social mobility with respect to race and how immigration, for example, the Windrush generation shapes social mobility today? I think this of course relates to lots of research on how one aspect of rising inequality in societies is correlated with the fact we've become multi-ethnic societies across the world. And perhaps that relates to the declining sense of solidarity or whatever the sort of, so, but generally what's your view on those sorts of issues, Steve? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so to, to, to answer it really concretely, we, we have real data limitations to look at it very carefully, carefully in, 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 in the kinds of exercises that, that we've done here. I, I mean, it's a big deal in the US literature. Uh, you know, I, I mean, Raj Jetty's work it pulls out really interesting things uh, about because the stuff, you know, for, for example, the work he's done with very detailed geographical mobility shows that places like Baltimore have really low social mobility. Places, you know, like San Jose have, have relatively high social mobility, almost almost up to the Scandinavian levels, not quite, but almost. So there's, you know, there's massive dispersion of this in, in, in the US. It's a different matter here, but the question, the question that was asked, you know, I mean, you know, the Sewell report was supposed to be looking at that kind of thing and then really didn't do it very well at all. Um, and, and actually didn't look properly at the way in which um, uh, race-based um, earning labor market differences have persisted quite a lot and haven't really, uh, haven't, haven't really improved um, very much at all. So on the labor market side of things, we know there's uh, certain rigidities there uh, and we also know, I think, from the education side of things, that we we know we know we there's quite there's, you know there's pretty good work that uh, Lucinda Platt and Anthony Heath have done, uh, looking at access to university for for people from different ethnic backgrounds, uh, and you know and and whilst there has been improvements in people getting in, getting into the top end uh, places has been very limited, I think, and still so there's sort of a kind of ceiling that seems to, to operate there. I mean, I think you know a bit more about that than I do, maybe Anna, but there is there is stuff on that, isn't there? Yes, and it depends which part of the education system you look in as to you know, what you take away from it, which is where I think the Sewell report uh, was misleading. So in terms of school qualifications, even when you allow for socioeconomic background, there are some, minor well, most minority ethnic groups do pretty well in that bit of the system. Um, but Steve's quite right when it comes to access to the elite institutions, there are still barriers by ethnicity. And then on top of that, I think the really big issue, which was completely missed, is the point that once you enter the labour market, we're still seeing... Um, uh, wages vary by ethnicity for people which, with the same level of education. So the way I think about this is that if you're from some minority ethnic groups, you have to have a higher level of education just to stay in the same playing field as someone uh, from a white background uh, in terms of their earnings. And that, that is not uh, a level playing field. And that, to my mind, is yeah. sort of prima facie evidence of, of racism in the system. So part of the argument is we need a lot better data collection that are, that with large enough data sets that allow us actually to study some of this stuff. Uh, we don't have enough data on ethnic minority households and individuals in some of our big survey data that you've used in your research, Steve. We've, we've got some, but we, we always need better data. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we're going to have to wrap it up there, I'm afraid. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Anna. This has been a fantastic event. Thank you all for, for coming along and thanks for the great questions and look out for more CEP events in the future. Thank you all. Goodbye.